Okay, my fellow crypto holders, over the past 24 hours, something rather interesting is going to happen. But also, it seems to me, a lot of crypto holders are confused about the status of XRP and Ripple right now. What's going on? Because uh, I've read the comments, all right? Now, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, in the next 24 hours, matter of fact, I think it's about 15 hours or so from now, maybe a little bit less, the US inflation numbers are going to come out. And almost every single time it happens, the markets shake a little. So... I'm just telling you straight away, expect some volatility. Obviously, as the inflation rate numbers get announced, if everything goes as expected, I don't believe anything really crazy is going to happen. Perhaps the core inflation month over month is going to be the interesting outlier, or perhaps a lower year over year normal inflation. Long story short, tomorrow is an interesting day for that. Just make sure you are aware. And if you're wondering, why is the market moving all of a sudden? It is probably that. Point number two that I think is rather interesting is the outflows or the lack thereof with the Bitcoin ETFs. A little while back, there was basically a consensus that the Bitcoin ETFs or the Ethereum ETFs were going to see some massive outflows. Partially with Ethereum, just we all expected some crazy outflows to happen, but also slightly more on the Bitcoin side. And I think Rookie had an interesting post about it. He said, I don't get it. How are the Ethereum E outflows so much lower than GBTC outflows were when it first launched? ETH E had zero outflows yesterday. I don't think market expected this, lol. Feels like we priced in a scenario where ETH E mimics GBTC in outflows, but we're getting something completely different. What am I missing here? If you do not know, GBTC is Grayscale's Bitcoin, which since its inception, raked up a ton of Bitcoin, but since the ETFs basically launched, you know, all of them, they upped their fees significantly. But this allowed for people to cash out, which uh, first wasn't really as possible. But now they cash out on the on the market, so to speak. And they've been doing that for an extremely long time. For the most part, though, what we're expecting is that even though they're cashing out in one rail, they're actually buying it in another, uh, supposedly for the most part, BlackRock's ETF. However, taking a look at Ethereum, even though this is where it started, right? It has been a lot of outflows. It's, first of all, rather quiet now. But I mean, for the most part, that it just was a really easy decline to now zero yesterday. I mean, we didn't really see any inflows either anywhere. It's been practically zero on everything. But the fact that it's also zero on ETH or Ethereum E, oh, this is so annoying, these names. That is, in my opinion, quite peculiar and it's causing us to be a little bit in the middle as to where prices are going think about it if everybody expected the ethereum etfs here to drop way more ethereum but it didn't but we basically were selling off in preparation for that crazy sell-off to happen in the etfs but then that sell-off doesn't happen do we now pump them because people want to buy it back knowing that the major institutions won't keep dumping more because i mean I, I can't really see this in any negative scenario for the most part, them not selling as much can only be seen as positive, I think. A little side story, if you've not followed me on Instagram just quite yet, but you like lifestyle things or whatever, make sure you check it out. I'll leave a link in the description or just type in the Dusty BC. So the main idea being, since we saw Grayscale Bitcoin and the crazy outflows there, what happened now is that people front ran this whole debacle. They sold really hard into the ETFs opening up. And again, the expectation was, as I remind you from what we said a few months back, what we expect with Ethereum is pretty similar to Bitcoin. Price is going down for the first couple of weeks for it to then quickly recover at a rapid pace after the majority of the Grayscale participants sold. Now, since that part is kind of over within a month, which we expect it to be slightly longer, is this the time now where we start popping off? You know, with Bitcoin, it was slightly longer because there was more to sell, perhaps. And perhaps as we have the previous data now, and history doesn't have to repeat itself, but A, perhaps this time around, though, it's going to be a lot faster, this recovery. I don't know. Bitcoin just went above 61,000 from 58,000 somewhere yesterday. So we're back on a good pace. And I'll remind you again that whenever we get to these low prices, I'm just buying. I'm not really afraid of anything. Most of my money is in crypto, and that's the way I'm going to keep it. Now, another interesting piece, something I just dropped like an hour ago. XRP Ripple lawsuit. For your information from Bloomberg Crypto, the outcome of the Ripple SEC case could help shape the future of other crypto battles. Chris Dolmetsch <laughs> writes in the crypto newsletter on Bloomberg. Now, first of all, this kind of shocked me. When I saw Ripple SEC in the headline, I thought, she something interesting is going to be popping up here. But it was actually rather tame, as it's just somebody writing an article about why Ripple now concluding this battle, let's call it, because uh, again, from the SEC side, the SEC won. From Ripple side, Ripple won. 
Uh, obviously, there is $125 million in payments, though. So it is definitely debatable as to who won. In my opinion, Ripple won because they got everything they wanted and the SEC didn't get their full amount. But I do believe there's a good argument to be made that Ripple indeed violated some stuff, now had to pay up, so they theoretically speaking lost. But for the most part, he also concludes, uh, quote, and that could be good news for other crypto companies battling the SEC. The fact that the penalty, for example, is nowhere close to what the SEC had imagined. And the fact that the loss would rally the greater crypto industry around XRP, that they got everybody together. The SEC created an informa uh, information vacuum. Just generally speaking, it's been quite positive about it all. And there comes the point, right? I, I wanted to go through it, but there's not really anything too interesting in this. It just talks about the fact that 876 million in disgorgement was asked, 200 million dollars in interest, which that is actually criminal. The fact that the SEC tried to pull that string, uh, along with 876 million in civil penalty. So wild numbers. Uh, anyway, that was the interesting. Part. What I find kind of crazy is the amount of people in my comment section saying, Dusty, you're a freaking imbecile. The case is not over. But there's two things that people are saying for the most for now. One is the case ain't over. I'm not sure how you people are pulling that out of your hat. Just because an appeal is possible doesn't mean a conclusion is now in. Uh, what theoretically speaking can happen is they can open the case again. And on the opposite side, point number two is a lot of people are saying, uh, since we didn't pump right now, does that mean I have to wait another six years for an XRP pump? And to that, I'll state, if you have not been able to make a good profit with your XRP the last couple of months, years, let's say, then you've been playing the game wrong. And I'll, I'll, I'm going to say that now, even though I usually am not a big fan of telling people they're stupid. I really don't want to call anybody stupid, but I will call people bad traders or perhaps not the best in investments. Even though I'm not your financial advisor, please understand that. I do know a lot about investing. I've been doing it for a long time. And if you've been following the videos for a while, you know one of my main mottos, which is buy the freaking dip. If you really stick, stick with that, right? It is pretty easy to turn a profit because for crypto, we've only ever known a bull market, really. I mean, there's been bear markets for about a year, but literally it's all that. It's been a year of down, three years of up. A year of down, three years of up. A year of down, three years of up. That's the system. That's how it's been working for a long time. Yes, at some point it might change, but if you are not able to turn this whole crypto endeavor into a profit, then you've not been playing the game right thus far. Again, you can always change though. You're never too late to learn. And when it comes to XRP in 2021, because people say, oh, I've been holding for seven years, I'm still at a loss. How? If, wherever you bought at, doesn't matter. In 2020, March, the price was 10 cents. One year later, the price was nearly $2. That's a 20X over that bull run. And people are saying XRP did nothing. It's a 20 mother freaking X. If it does that now, we're at $10, right? That's to conceptualize it. Even though the loss was going on, it was still able to do a 20 X in that run. So whenever I talk about a 20 X now, oh, but XRP is higher than it was back then. Sure. But it's not that odd. The numbers we're talking about here are not that crazy, not that wild, especially with the fact that back then there was a loss going on and right now there isn't. And the fact that XRP has stepped down a lot of steps from its high points from earlier. I do believe they're going to be reclaiming some of the Ethereum market cap back in due course. But again, this is what I have to always make sure I say a couple of times per video. If we're wrong, if XRP doesn't ever go back to high points, it's, it's possible, right? Let's be logicians here. It's possible that some investment you have doesn't work out the way you thought it was. Well, the counter to that is to just not only have all your eggs into one basket, just have multiple different coins. Don't only hold one crypto, even if you believe in it to the, to the bare bone. It is never a smart idea. I hold some coins that I do not actually believe in that much. Why? You know why? And I'm, I'm going to be real honest with you. It's because one of my friends talked about it. Some of my friends at a party talked about it. Or because I got a good deal, for example, that I bought it so cheap and I'm up a lot already. I'm thinking, hmm. You know why I'm not selling that? You know, I'm still holding that. Because I personally have like a big vendetta against me having, for example, let's say, right? $1,000 in a coin. And I'm selling it now because I'm thinking 1000 is still 1000 But then it turns into a hundred, or it turns into a million, right? 100000 or a million. Because I've had it before. Uh, you guys know the story where I had like a uh, 800x on a coin that I thought was worthless and I didn't sell because I kind of figured it was worthless. It was like, ah, I moved it to the exchange, but I didn't end up selling it. My friend did. And then I did an 800x over the next following weeks. And I only know about it because of you guys in the comment section, which was really funny. The coin was called Nosana. But that's also a reason I have a lot of dust. I have a lot of coins that I don't even know the name of that I have like a couple hundred dollars in, a couple thousand dollars in. And I just leave it for in case it does a crazy multiplier. Uh, by the way, not only large numbers, there are also some coins I've got $38 in, for example, that I 
I can't tell you the ticker of just because I bought it once and I'm, I am I refuse to sell in case it does a thousand X. I know that's how you waste a lot of money. I know because for the most part, it goes down forever. <laughs> but again, I prefer for it to go down with the ship than me having to look at the fact that I sold it for like 30 bucks and it would have been like $500,000. Nah, you know, can't have that. Anyway, that goes my point again. You never really know what the next crazy coin is going to be. So it's always wise to have some additional baskets or at least some additional eggs in different baskets. Regardless of how certain you are of your own investment, it is almost always wise to not make it one single thing. That doesn't mean you can't stay in one sector. Even that I'm personally against, but that's a personal preference. If you wanna, for example, only do AI coins or only AI this, that, this, that, I think that's actually viable. Some people are big fans of only staying in one sector, having your full focus on one thing, and I kind of agree. For example, let's say the bull market's really raging on, I think it's wiser to focus on a specific sector and then kind of hope it pops off. Uh, because if it does, if you are right on that front, then you have a very high likelihood of making a crazy multiplier because you know the sector really well. You probably have set yourself up for success with the right coins. If you have to do this for every sector, there's not enough time in the world to do it for every sector, basically. So you have to make choices at that point. Uh, my personal thesis is at this point though is never put your eggs into one basket. Just put a little bit here and there, here, there. Go for everything because you do not know what's going to be crazy hot and popping in the next six months. And that's basically what we're doing right now. We're waiting to see what the next pivot is going to be. Is it going to be AI? Is it going to be real world assets? Is it going to be this, that, this, that? Tomorrow, like I said, could spark an interesting day. Again, the bull market, we all know it's confirmed. There's no question about it. But it seems like the biggest selling for the Ethereum ETFs is over. Perhaps this is where we start turning back around. I'm it feels to me like we can't go down that much longer. My longs are still open, guys. I've not closed them yet. I'm still buying the dips like crazy. Call me a maniac, but I think it's the best way to get crazy sums of money over the next few months. And uh, yeah, that's about it.